on the phone. And we do have some questions here over on the chat. Uh, Frank, someone earlier on asked if you would talk a little bit about the origin bone, bone law. Bone, let me go back to that. Uh, so talking talking about the um, uh, the bone law of in, in Australia we're talking about? Yes, Australia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, here we go. I can see that. Yeah. Um, look, I'm uh, I'm not a uh, an expert by any means of the uh, indigenous law here in Australia, but I have been speaking with uh, elders, and this has been an ongoing process, and it's been an honour to speak with them. And I can share with you that there is a, a number of things that are being um, confirmed. And if I can just do that, and then, then maybe we can direct to specifics. The first is that there is a recognition now by the elders and a profession by the elders in stating that their law is one. And their law is reflected, in fact, now in the canons uh, under the systems of law, under canon number 240 as uh, Ari, as well as uh, Yapa is the term, Yapa law. So Ari, Yapa, or tribal law. And the second is that the elders are working together, similar to what is happening in the nations in North, Central and South America on the five worlds to create a single body of story and law and that is called in honour of the universal terms used by all the tribes and recognised by all the tribes uh, is called Barumban Jukukpa that's B-A-U-U-M-B-A-N hyphen J-U-K-U-R-R-P-A. Baramban Jukulpa, which is Yapa. Yapa, the law, is the dream, is the story. So this is a historic moment for them because this belief and this truth was lost to them and they are reawakening to it. As to what the bone law uh, refers to, whether you're talking about pointing of a bone and certain ceremonies involving bones, I will have to take that on notice and ask for uh, one of uh, them, and we've had a number who have been on the calls, to respond. So I'm sorry for being such a long-winded answer, but I wanted to give you the context, and uh, I will take on notice and ask them to respond. I don't want to be banking presumptions on the principles behind it. Okay? I think that would be great, Frank. And uh, that was that was wonderful. Uh, so you're, what you're saying is that you can possibly get back in a week or two with uh, some more information on that. Yeah. I mean, we, we will we will definitely answer that question by the next conversation. If not. We, we we do actually have um, someone actually up on the system who may be able to answer that, Darwin Born. Uh, I'm sure would be able to answer that question uh, later on. Um, actually, if we can get Darwin Born to call in, uh, he would certainly be able to answer that question. Okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, he, he may be on the computer and on the phone line here that uh, maybe he can take a moment and cover that. All right, next question. Can we use our Eucadian seal with added red thumbprint uh, inside the stamp or seal or what is the recommendation on you know how you are covering the signature? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The, what is important with the information and a, a number of you have typed in um, comments when I've mentioned different people who have got who, who are at the moment saying different things uh, whether it be uh, people in Canada, uh, whether it be, uh, I mentioned um, uh, David Clarence, there are, there are different opinions on different ideas and what I don't want to do is I don't want to 
uh, prejudice the work we're doing at the moment, which is a comprehensive cataloging and representation of the material in light of all the work that you see here that makes it clear for all of you how best to use the tools that we provide to you. And, and that's a long-winded way of saying how you use your seals is something that needs to be uh, readdressed in light of this information. Now, I know one thing I can say which is absolutely crystal clear now. If you have followed the ecclesiastical deed process and you have sent documents using the ecclesiastical deed process, then nothing you have done is deficient. Nothing. All we're doing is refining. There's no point pursuing the same thing over and over and over again when you have new information that can make it easier. If you can do it in two steps, why do 20 steps? That's all we're saying. So the short, the short answer, <laughs> I keep saying this, the short answer is, uh, yes, you can use your seals, but how you use it, I just ask for all of you to be patient in allowing us to refine the information so that we're not going to say, yes, use this, and then tomorrow, so don't use it for this. I, I don't want to confuse people. And if you can hold off, then the information we set on signing and sealing in the canons uh, gives some pretty good indication of what you can and can't do. So just, just hang for a minute. If you can hold back on sending something with a seal for a week, that would be great. Wonderful. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we've got a caller here, uh, Northeast California. Let's get to them real quick. Northeast California, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I was uh, I'm interested to ask Frank, uh, he had mentioned something in the last talk show about uh, using a coupon uh, when doing the A for B process, and I was wondering if you could clarify about that. Sure. Um, the the tradition, I mean, okay, except for value um, and and the principle, the principles behind A, A to V. What we what we mention is that the the concept of a remittance is that uh, whenever in their system uh, they send you uh, a bill, um, effectively uh, it is the completion of an ecclesiastical role, it is about the balancing of the books. But in that process, um, when you, um, when they send you a bill and you want to settle it, uh, the coupon is the transmission of your remittance back to them and, and your instruction back to them on how to handle the account. Right. We haven't we haven't put up any instruction on how um, to deal with tax uh, bills or utility bills or any of the other bills that come into the system that trade off the accounts. Um, and the reason we haven't done that yet is that the history behind it, and I, I think actually fortuitously, a knowledge of what the role of executor means has not been fully there. Now, I think what has, has caused people to get into great strife before with accepted for value now, if I look at it in, in light of the new information, it is that they've done it as a trustee and therefore they have breached the fiduciary duties of the bylaws that tell the trustees they are not permitted to do that. Right. But when you are the executor, and someone is uh, trading on your property. Do you have a right to, to intervene? Like, for example, if you are the if you are the executor, if you're in charge of a property, let's say, let's just use land for example. Say you're the executor of the home. You've got a fence. If someone walks onto your property, do you have a right to tell them to get off? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Okay. Well, that's the that's the difference, I believe, and that's the key, I believe, to successful acceptance for value, is as the executor, you have the right to direct how accounts are handled. But if you sit within the role of being a trustee, 
then they can use all their statutes against you. And if you look at the statutes, they're very clear. The statutes say you can't do these things. So this is where I think people have been getting into trouble. They've been doing A for V as a trustee. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot, makes it a lot more clear. Really appreciate okay. it, Frank. All right, good uh, on you. Yeah, thanks for all you're doing. Uh, you're really inspiring a lot of folks here in uh, Northern California and getting getting the word out about uh, the processes uh, through Acadia, and I uh, really appreciate everything you're doing. So thank you. Well, all the best with what you're doing. Good luck. Okay, bye. Thank you so much for calling in and for your question, Northeast California. appreciate that. Uh, all right, we have Ron on the line. Hello, Ron. Hi, Frank. Hi, Terry. Hi, Ron. Hi. Hey. There's some weird stuff going on over here. Most of the people that were dialed in on the you know, listening via Internet, they're all getting disconnected. It happened to me mm. twice already. I'm just letting you know. But anyway, hey, um, on Article 99, which is the estate article, Yep. At Canon 2034, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read like half the sentence here. It says, however, when a man or woman demonstrating competence, wisdom, humility, and duty gives public notice as to acceptance of occupying the office of general executor of the estate. Okay. Um, my thought on that is, to do some sort of a public notice and record it at the county recorders. Uh, I, sent, I sent you an example of what I'm work, what Greg and I are working on, but we're really stuck on how to finish it, either sign it, seal it, just put by general executor. Um, we read all of the articles on seal and sign, and we can't find specific instruction on notice on a notice yeah well i would the way i would uh, uh if you want to as you know in their system <clears throat> the county recorders are for the recording of deeds yeah right but they have miscellaneous um uh, recordings also yeah but what you could do is you could effectively put in a deed poll which is your acceptance of the office and the duties of uh, general office of general executor of the estate yeah okay so when you seal it it's of course it's um, it's one way so what you're effectively doing is accepting your responsibilities uh, and duties of the office of general executor of the estate and the administration uh, well the direction of all uh, attending property so uh, you're basically offering it, um, and if you want to do it, you could even say that you're accepting the offer of the divine, because it's actually the divine in, in the opening of Genesis that says, I give you dominion. Right. I use that, by the way. I give you dominion, and and you are the heirs. So the offer, is, the offer has been made by the divine. Right. So now, your deed poll in the county recorder of deeds, yeah, Yep. is accepting your obligation and duty. I think that would be a really nice way to do it. If that's if that's the angle you want to do it in, then that would be a really nice way. Yeah. Would I seal it with a red thumbprint? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would yeah, I need absolutely. witnesses? Would you, well, yes. Two witnesses would be excellent. Okay. Yeah? Now, my other thought was to do a revocation of um, signatures on the same document. What do you think about that idea? You know, the signatures well, that... Well, we've done the revocation signatures before, and, and, it, it, and I know Terry's got some great experience on this too, and there are examples where it's worked. But in a sense, when you claim the... Okay, let, let's let's... Let's clear the air for the moment. Let's just look at this. When you're battling them one trust at a time, then I'd say revocation of signatures is important because it's one of the presumptions built into the trust, yeah? Yep. But at that level, you're battling in the trenches, yeah? Yep. 
When you assume the role of general executive,